Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? You tried to get into the locked drawer. The Beast in the Cave by H.P. Lovecraft The horrible conclusion which had been gradually obtruding itself upon my confused and reluctant mind was now an awful certainty. I was lost, completely, hopelessly lost, in the vast and labyrinthine recesses of the mammoth cave. Turn as I might, in no direction could my straining vision seize on any object capable of serving as a guidepost to set me on the outward path. That never more should I behold the blessed light of day, or scan the pleasant hills and dales of the beautiful world outside, my reason could no longer entertain the slightest unbelief. Hope had departed. Yet, indoctrinated as I was by a life of philosophical study, I derived no small measure of satisfaction from my unimpassioned demeanour. For, although I had frequently read of the wild frenzies into which were thrown the victims of similar situations, I experienced none of these, but stood quiet as soon as I clearly realised the loss of my bearings. Nor did the thought that I had probably wandered beyond the utmost limits of an ordinary search cause me to abandon my composure, even for a moment. If I must die, I reflected, then was this terrible yet majestic cavern as welcome a sepulchre as that which any churchyard might afford, a conception which carried with it more of tranquillity than of despair. Starving would prove my ultimate fate, of this I was certain. Some I knew had gone mad under circumstances such as these, but I felt that this end would not be mine. My disaster was the result of no fault save my own, since, unbeknown to the guide, I had separated myself from the regular party of sightseers, and wandering for over an hour in forbidden avenues of the cave, had found myself unable to retrace the devious windings which I had pursued since forsaking my companions. Already my torch had begun to expire. Soon I would be enveloped by the total and almost palpable blackness of the bowels of the earth. As I stood in the waning, unsteady light, I idly wondered over the exact circumstances of my coming end. I remembered the accounts which I had heard of the colony of consumptives who, taking their residence in this gigantic grotto to find health from the apparently salubrious air of the underground world, with its steady, uniform temperature, pure air and peaceful quiet, had found, instead, death in strange and ghastly form. I had seen the sad remains of their ill-made cottages as I passed them by with the party, and had wondered what unnatural influence a long sojourn in this immense and silent cavern would exert upon one as healthy and as vigorous as I. Now, I grimly told myself, my opportunity for settling this point had arrived, provided that want of food should not bring me too speedy a departure from this life. As the last fitful rays of my torch faded into obscurity, I resolved to leave no stone unturned, no possible means of escape neglected. So, summoning all the powers possessed by my lungs, I set up a series of loud shoutings in the vain hope of attracting the attention of the guide by my clamour. Yet, as I called, I believed in my heart that my cries were to no purpose, and that my voice, magnified and reflected by the numberless ramparts of the black maze about me, fell upon no ears save my own. All at once, however, my attention was fixed with a start, as I fancied that I heard the sound of soft approaching steps on the rocky floor of the cavern. Was my deliverance about to be accomplished so soon? Had, then, all my horrible apprehensions been for naught? And was the guide, having marked my unwarranted absence from the party, following my course and seeking me out in this limestone labyrinth? Whilst these joyful queries arose in my brain, I was on the point of renewing my cries in order that my discovery might come the sooner, when, in an instant, my delight was turned to horror as I listened. 
for my ever acute ear, now sharpened in even greater degree by the complete silence of the cave, bore to my benumbed understanding the unexpected and dreadful knowledge that these footfalls were not like those of any mortal man. In the unearthly stillness of this subterranean region, the tread of the booted guide would have sounded like a series of sharp and incisive blows. These impacts were soft and stealthy, as of the padded paws of some feline. Besides, at times, when I listened carefully, I seemed to trace the falls of four instead of two feet. I was now convinced that I had by my cries aroused and attracted some wild beast, perhaps a mountain lion which had accidentally strayed within the cave. Perhaps I considered the Almighty had chosen me for a swifter and more merciful death than that of hunger. Yet the instinct of self-preservation, never wholly dormant, was stirred in my breast, and though escape from the oncoming peril might but spare me for a sterner and more lingering end, I determined nevertheless to part with my life at as high a price as I could command. Strange as it may seem, my mind conceived of no intent on the part of the visitor save of that of hostility. Accordingly, I became very quiet in the hope that the unknown beast would, in the absence of a guiding sound, lose its direction as had I, and thus pass me by. But this hope was not destined for realisation, for the strange footfalls steadily advanced, the animal evidently having obtained my scent, which in an atmosphere so absolutely free from all distracting influences as is that of the cave, could doubtless be followed at great distance. Seeing, therefore, that I must be armed for defence against an uncanny and unseen attack in the dark, I grouped about me the largest of the fragments of rock which were strewn upon all parts of the floor of the cavern in the vicinity, and grasping one in each hand for immediate use, awaited with resignation the inevitable result. Meanwhile, the hideous pattering of the paws drew near. Certainly, the conduct of the creature was exceedingly strange. Most of the time, the tread seemed to be that of a quadruped, walking with a singular lack of unison betwixt hind and forefeet, yet, at brief and infrequent intervals, I fancied that but two feet were engaged in the process of locomotion. I wondered what species of animal was to confront me. It must, I thought, be some unfortunate beast who had paid for its curiosity to investigate one of the entrances of the fearful grotto with a lifelong confinement in its interminable recesses. It doubtless obtained as food the eyeless fish, bats and rats of the cave, as well as some of the ordinary fish that are wafted in at every freshet of green river, which communicates in some occult manner with the waters of the cave. I occupied my terrible vigil with grotesque conjectures of what alterations cave life might have wrought in the physical structure of the beast, remembering the awful appearances ascribed by local tradition to the consumptives who had died after long residence in the cavern. Then I remembered with a start that, even should I succeed in killing my antagonist, I should never behold its form, as my torch had long since been extinct, and I was entirely unprovided with matches. The tension on my brain now became frightful. My disordered fancy conjured up hideous and fearsome shapes from the sinister darkness that surrounded me, and that actually seemed to press upon my body. Nearer, nearer the dreadful footfalls approached. It seemed that I must give vent to a piercing scream, yet had I been sufficiently irresolute to attempt such a thing, my voice could scarce have responded. I was petrified rooted to the spot, I doubted if my right arm would allow me to hurl its missile at the oncoming thing, when the crucial moment should arrive. Now the steady pat-pat of the steps was close at hand. Now, very close. I could hear the laboured breathing of the animal, and, terror-struck as I was, I realised that it must have come from a considerable distance, and was correspondingly fatigued. Suddenly the spell broke, my right hand, guided by my ever-trustworthy sense of hearing, threw with full force the sharp-angled bit of limestone which it contained, toward that point in the darkness from which emanated the breathing and pattering, and, wonderful to relate, it nearly reached its goal, for I heard the thing jump 
landing at a distance away where it seemed to pause. Having readjusted my aim, I discharged my second missile, this time most effectively, for with a flood of joy I listened as the creature fell in what sounded like a complete collapse and evidently remained prone and unmoving. Almost overjoyed by the great relief which rushed over me, I reeled back against the wall. The breathing continued in heavy, gasping inhalations and expirations, whence I realised that I had no more than wounded the creature, and now all desire to examine the thing ceased. At last something allied to groundless, superstitious fear had entered my brain, and I did not approach the body, nor did I continue to cast stones at it in order to complete the extinction of its life. Instead, I ran at full speed in what was, as nearly as I could estimate, in my frenzied condition, the direction from which I had come. Suddenly I heard a sound, or or rather a regular succession of sounds. In another instant they had resolved themselves into a series of sharp metallic clicks. This time there was no doubt. It was the guide! And then I shouted, yelled, screamed, even shrieked with joy as I beheld in the vaulted arches above the faint and glimmering effulgence which I knew to be the reflected light of an approaching torch. I ran to meet the flare, and before I could completely understand what had occurred, was lying on the ground at the feet of the guide, embracing his boots and gibbering, despite my boasted reserve, in a most meaningless and idiotic manner, pouring out my terrible story and at the same time overwhelming my auditor with protestations of gratitude. At length I awoke to something like my normal consciousness. The guide had noted my absence upon the arrival of the party at the entrance of the cave, and had, from his own intuitive sense of direction, proceeded to make a thorough canvas of the by-passages just ahead of where he had last spoken to me, locating my whereabouts after a quest of about four hours. By the time he had related this to me, I, emboldened by his torch and his company, began to reflect upon the strange beast which I had wounded, but a short distance, back in the darkness, and suggested that we ascertain, by the rushlight's aid, what manner of creature was my victim. Accordingly, I retraced my steps, this time with a courage born of companionship, to the scene of my terrible experience. Soon we descried a white object upon the floor an object whiter even than the gleaming limestone itself. Cautiously advancing, we gave vent to a simultaneous ejaculation of wonderment, for of all the unnatural monsters either of us had in our lifetimes beheld, this was in surpassing degree the strangest. It appeared to be an anthropoid ape of large proportions, escaped perhaps from some itinerant menagerie, Its hair was snow-white, a thing no doubt due to the bleaching action of a long existence within the inky confines of the cave, but it was also surprisingly thin, being indeed largely absent, save on the head, where it was of such length and abundance that it fell over the shoulders in considerable profusion. The face was turned away from us, as the creature lay almost directly upon it. The inclination of the limbs was very singular, explaining, however, the alternation in their use which I had before noted, whereby the beast used sometimes all four, and on other occasions but two, for its progress. From the tips of the fingers or toes long nail-like claws extended. The hands or feet were not prehensile, a fact that I ascribed to that long residence in the cave which, as I before mentioned, seemed evident from the all-pervading and almost unearthly whiteness so characteristic of the whole anatomy. No tail seemed to be present. The respiration had now grown very feeble, and the guide had drawn his pistol with the evident intent of dispatching the creature, when a sudden sound emitted by the latter caused the weapon to fall unused. The sound was of a nature difficult to describe. It was not like the normal note of any known species of simian, and I wondered if this unnatural quality were not the result of a long-continued and complete silence, broken by the sensations produced by the advent of the light, a thing which the beast could not have seen since its first entrance into the cave. The sound, which I might feebly attempt to classify as a kind of deep-toned chattering, was faintly continued. All at once 
a fleeting spasm of energy seemed to pass through the frame of the beast. The paws went through a convulsive motion and the limbs contracted. With a jerk, the white body rolled over so that its face was turned in our direction. For a moment I was so struck with horror at the eyes thus revealed that I noted nothing else. They were black, those eyes, deep, jetty black, in hideous contrast to the snow-white hair and flesh. Like those of other cave denizens, they were deeply sunken in their orbits and were entirely destitute of iris. As I looked more closely, I saw that they were set in a face less prognathous than that of the average ape and infinitely more hairy. The nose was quite distinct. As we gazed upon the uncanny sight presented to our vision, the thick lips opened and several sounds issued from them, after which the thing relaxed in death. The guide clutched my coat sleeve and trembled so violently that the light shook fitfully, casting weird, moving shadows on the walls about us. I made no motion, but stood rigidly still, my horrified eyes fixed upon the floor ahead. Then fear left, and wonder, awe, compassion, and reverence succeeded in its place, for the sounds uttered by the stricken figure that lay stretched out on the limestone had told us the awesome truth. The creature I had killed, the strange beast of the unfathomed cave, was, or had at one time been, a man. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. That way you help me make more stories for you Everybody and get knows. access to a patrons-only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. So wel welcome, Todd. Um, we've just heard the H.P. Lovecraft story, uh, The Beast in the Cave, and uh, you very kindly sent me a copy of your chapbook of The Beast in the Cave, which you've taken Lovecraft's story. Uh, I'm going to show some video of this so people can see it better. You've illustrated it. It looks, it's, it, I mean, and it's a limited edition, and um, but you've put this wonderful things like the flashlight bookmark in it. Uh, and it's 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 absolutely a beautiful piece of work. The people won't be able to uh, feel it, but the even the paper quality, this is a, this feels like a a precious object, you know. Uh, so, but before we get ahead of ourselves, um, I just wanted to ask you about how how did you come. I mean, I guess I'm interested in the story. Why did you pick that? But I'm particularly interested in how did you come to make such a thing as this? Okay. Um, well, I run uh, Angel Bomb, which is a small letterpress print shop in uh, Minnesota in the United States. Mm. And uh, I've been uh, running Angel Bomb since 1997, so 26 years now. Mm. Uh, primarily it was set up for doing client work. I, I'm a graphic designer, so I've been a designer for over 30 years. And so it was mostly client based, but about 10 years ago, I made my first book, uh, as a professional and it was a, like a, a graphic novel that I wrote. And so, um, I've been getting more and more into book arts, less, less, you know, kind of drifting away from, from the client work and focusing on, on fine book arts. And um, a lot of my projects are either science fiction or horror based. And I, I, I like those as a way of looking at or analyzing kind of um, problems in society. And um, I've, I've done a couple of works. Well, I've done one other piece that was Lovecraft inspired. It was like an ode to Lovecraft. I grew up in a small town in North Dakota, which was um, just culturally deficit. And um, it was, it, you know, a small town, small town thinking, like there was just no creativity. And as a, as a creative person, even as a youth, like I just struggled. And discovering uh, Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft um, was like a boon to me. And just kind of opened my eyes to, um, 
you know, a broader world. It kind of gave me this love of uh, the New England setting with the the twisted boughs on branches and, you know, the, the, the hills and the valleys and the um, just this beautiful area, which also had this sort of spookiness. Mm. Um, but I loved Lovecraft for his, his otherworldly, you know, unnameable creatures. And um, so it was really, I wanted to do something, a, a small little chat book that would sort of honor this history that I have with, with him and his stories and was looking for something. Most of my projects take a long time, a couple of years at least. And so I wanted to do something that was a little bit shorter I'm so inspired by uh, pulps, the early, early pulp stories, as well as like the illustrations. I mean, I think, you know, so much of science fiction, so much of the, the what we see today owes a, um, you know, owes something to that, that kind of the golden age of, of sci-fi era in the, you know, early to mid 1900s. And so I just just wanted to do a little piece that sort of paid tribute to that. Um, yeah. So how long did it take you to produce this? It actually took close to a year, but that was, I'm always working on multiple projects at once. And um, it kind of took me a while to determine like the illustrative style. That's always kind of unique. Um, I want each Typically, each project I do looks different, and I wanted this to really have this. Um, I was reading a lot of like old, creepy and weird tales um, comics, and so I, you know, I was really wanted to pull that style of illustration in as as well. So it was probably like nine months to a year. Mm. And I mean, I think you know, we talked about the the pulp magazines that are like amazing stories and things like that. Mm -hmm. and they were all um they were pretty disposable they were they were cheaply produced cheap paper you read it you, and i guess people did collect them of course they did but they were, i don't think they were intended for collection yet this is this is a real quality piece of work this is probably this story has probably never been produced in such quality as this um probably not you know. yeah. and, and the, the, the paper itself um T tell me about the paper. How do you source the paper? So I, one of the things that I do when I work on a book project is um, I have a, I have an interest in experience, in experientiality or, or like the experience of interacting with the book. I, I seek to draw people in and have them make a deeper connection with the story through their interaction with it instead of just, a you know turning the page in a single narrative um i mean this is a pretty straightforward one but i still kind of hid things throughout there that you know would um you know kind of delight you as you explore there's some yeah. blind impressions of the stalactites and stalagmites on the cover yeah. um you know the, the 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 dust jacket if you hold it up to the light it, it looks like a watermark um through the it cover is. there um, and then with that, uh, with the, the sewn in flashlight as a bookmark. So this is really kind of playing across the, the idea of that this book is all about like fear, fear of the other. And so it kind of, in the way my mind works, when I want to uh, put a story on the, on the paper, um, you know, how can, how can I expand that? How can I, uh, bring sort of my own, uh, creativity my own um thoughts to that story while still paying tribute you know not not changing it so mm. i thought that the you know especially with lovecraft's famous quote about fear you know mm. the strongest emotion of man is fear the strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown i thought that that felt really um you know that tied in so well with the story and it it seems to really hearken to a lot of things that's going on in the world today. We're so we've got bigger issues to deal with, but we're still worried about that dude because his clothes are weird or their color is different or something. And it's just, I don't know, I guess that's something I want to analyze and kind of yeah. bring to the forefront. 
it's it's very tactile as you say uh the the cover which people won't get unless they touch it the weight of it um the the feel i'm running my fingers over the cover because the it's embossed i don't know if that is the technically correct uh, way of saying it it feels embossed you know there is a, there is a, mm -hmm. a texture to it the the flashlight bookmark which has a little message uh, a quote from lovecraft on the back even the thread is is like a quality thread it's, it, i don't know if it's a wax thread or but it feels mm -hmm. you know Uh, and so it's a very arresting thing. So it's really interesting what you say about. And then we, you know, we've got some of the uh, some of the stuff there. I, people might not be able to see this on on. Uh, they won't be able to see it if it's a podcast, of course. But um, you know, take my word for it. Um, it's uh, it's just it's wonderfully done, you know. And and when when you sent it to me, I thought because normally I talk to to writers as writers, but interestingly, recently did an interview with uh, Lewis Darley, who was a who was a, a filmmaker and a, a, an animator, really, um, as well as a writer. Um, so but it just grabbed me, you know. It really did. It really did grab me there. Now, um, you know, I've been reading a book. This book I've been reading called. Uh, Uh, saving the appearances by a guy called Owen Barfield, who was dead, and he was a friend of C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and people like that. It was one of the Inklings, and um, one of the it's a it's a hard book, you know. But uh, one of the things he says is that um, if you think you know, when you when you drink coffee, we think that it, we think we can separate it into I drink coffee as if they're separate things but these experiences don't they don't come in parts we lay we do that like post hoc we do that after the event so we experience the thing as a whole so all our experiences are as a whole so when we're reading the book um a funny thing people say to me if, if i ever they like hearing the turning of the pages so i used to think okay. right i want to i want to edit that out We want just the pure voice. But then, no, they like the turning of the page, pages because I think that's part of that whole book reading experience. And so for me, uh, particularly with this book, um, the feel of it, I can't get over the the, the visuals of it, the, the, the arresting graphics, uh, but also the feel of the page. And some of the, they are slightly, are they slightly different style? No, maybe not. They're not. I saw some of them. I thought, well, yeah, that looks slightly different. But um You know, people are going to see it. Um, yeah, no. So so what I'm saying about Owen Barfield is the fact that he would say, you know, you, when you drink the coffee, it's a full. So when you read a book, it is the full experience of reading the book. You don't go, I am. The story is in my head, but my, what are my fingers doing is separate. I think it enhances the um, the, the the story. So uh, and the, the other thing you said that was interesting is um You you have a similar task to me in lots of ways. In that, when people say, "Oh, read a story," yeah, it's not just it's about getting the right story at the right length, that is the right feel and is the right. You know, it has to be a lot of right things. And it sounds like you to pick I, this. I didn't know this one, The Beast in the Cave. I don't think I'd ever read it. It's like if I if I recall collect, correctly, like he started it when he was fourteen, mm -hmm. and and then I think it was first published when he was fifteen. Um, I liked it because there's a lot of these, and I read a lot of like old uh, sort of anthologies. So like right now I'm reading up a, a Twilight Zone anthology that contains all the, the original stories from like the first two seasons okay. that were then, you know, changed into to screenplays for the, the first two seasons of the show. And I mean, I grew up on those. And it, so to, to read the original stories and compare to the the television show is i find is really unique mm. um but so i i read a lot of these you know these these older stories and um something that draws me is these you know these these twist endings at the end or the you know these twists at the end and i thought that this was a delight even though as you read it as an adult i think you can pretty much see it coming but it almost felt to me like this would be a good introduction to not only um, like Lovecraft and horror for a young person, um, but almost an introduction to uh, the book as a collectible as well. Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm considered a, I guess, a, a fine press book artist, mm. um, even though, you know, I've done a lot of horror and science fiction versus, say, like, you know, uh, Thoreau, um, which a lot of traditional book artists, you know, m- may may gravitate towards. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a of a unique niche, but um, it's it's something in trying to because I felt such delight in discovering these stories as a kid. I kind of wanted to do something that if if you had a young person that you would you could introduce them to this, and it's not rife with his racism like his some of his later stuff. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you get a sense of his vocabulary starting to yeah. grow, yeah. you know, his, his, you know, um, I can't remember if, I think I read it somewhere where basically someone was like, you know, Lovecraft, why use 10 words when 26 <laughs> will do or something, yeah. you know, yeah. there's, there are these monosyllabic words and they're long. And it's just like, as a kid, I had to look, you know, I'd look those yeah. up. What does this mean? And it was again, just kind of part of that discovery. And you can, even though I, th- I think that, you know, this is a, a youthful story for him or a, a story from his youth, you can see that coming. You can kind of mm-hmm. feel that direction um, that, that he's, that he's going to. And I think that kind of gives a little bit greater depth or insight as well, you know, seeing something from different stages of, of someone's career. I mean, I think about Lovecraft's uh, use of language is is easily um, pastiched, if you like. You know, the unspeakably blasphemous, squamous, <laughs> blah, yeah. blah, blah, you know. Uh, and um, it's easy to do that. But I think he's coming from, in many ways, I know he's looking forward. His cosmic horror kind of is, is a development of um horror themes uh, or you know i read a lot of the classic ghost stories and and th- these weird tales and with ashton smith and people like that they're coming they're, they're looking forward to the new development is what i'm trying to say but he's this ornate vocabulary is something very victorian whereby the victorians mm. felt you know they were going to they were going to use these big words that you wouldn't use in ordinary language to heighten it i think uh, and to make it a separate exp- it wasn't intended to be naturalistic you know, like uh, we will, you know, these days you write, a, you pick up a, a novel and it's written in kind of street language, you know, to to, to be immediate. But they weren't doing that. And they knew nobody, nobody spoke like this. They knew that. But um, <laughs> it, it is and it, it's to try and stretch your vocabulary. So I think I think that that is interesting. It, not so much cosmic horror in this one, but um, the phobia. I mean, there is a little bit in that the weirdness of the the uh, the no spoilers because people have read it the 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 milk white ape man if you like um mm-hmm. that is fairly weird but um the the getting lost somewhere underground is in in the i mean i, I don't know if you Mag, Mag, magatina lasky did one called the tower which is all about vertigo it's a it's a phobia story basil copper did one called the spider which is a arachnophobia story so there is a fine um tradition of single phobia stories if you like you know uh, and and that's that's what this is um when you were, you were talking about i'm gonna you know my mind jumps so no no go right yeah, um, <laughs> it's okay <laughs> we were talking about um you're talking about north dakota now you have to understand my us geography is rudimentary so i can kind of point vaguely to a map of the states where that is how far are you from utah so north dakota is borders canada in mm. the middle of the country so yeah. it's it's central far north uh, mm. Utah would be um, further west, further west, yeah. um, and then further south. Okay, um, I'm not sure how to say like how many miles or kilometers it is, but it's about like maybe a third of the country away. So it's like a, a fair way away. away. Yeah, it's a fair way. Exactly. Away. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I'll tell you why I was saying that because um, uh, I remember flying over it once, but. Um, the Skinwalker Ranch jumped into my, you know, because there's those kind of cryptoid cryptids that lurk in 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 the middle 
the vast empty middle of the USA, you know, in in and you were talking about the sun baked plains, I think you said in, in the beginning. So I'm like, oh, yeah, what lurks there? I mean, what things are lurking there? And that seemed very Lovecraftian, but I'm I'm a thousand miles out. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah. So the climate is hot in the summer and cold. It's like a continental climate, hot in summer, cold, very, very cold in the winter. Yeah. Yes. And um, where I grew up, I mean, there there weren't a lot of trees, so it wasn't like a lot of shade. And I was also working on a on a farm. So it's mm -hmm. like you're out in a dusty field all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I hated it. So like in the winter, when you couldn't be, like to curl up inside and, you know, it's like the wind would rush down from from, you know, from Canada. It's very windy there. Mm. And, you know, with the blowing snow, like that was just the perfect setting to curl up with a book and mm. just get lost. There's a I friend of mine that. I've just seen uh, and he's saying uh, he's in Oregon and he's saying it's going to be like minus 10 degrees centigrade. And I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, yeah, that is, it's pretty cold, though. It's pretty cool. It's getting, yeah, it's gotten mm. like we've got a big kind of like a nationwide storm that's yeah. um, kind of affecting lots of places. So, yeah, it's it's suddenly much colder here than it has been in the last several weeks. So, and was it work that took you to Minnesota? Was it, was it, I, you know, how did that happen? I actually moved to Minnesota um, to, to attend college. Okay. Uh, so, I'm in, the, I'm in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Mm. Uh, this is where I went to school. And, um, you know, this was back in the late eighties mm -hmm. and then, um, I've, I've moved, I, I did go into the Navy and I've moved a little bit, but always came back because there's, there's a lot of nature around like Minnesota is much more wooded. Um, we're known as like the land of 10,000 lakes. So there's just a lot of nature to be yeah. had. That's and right. it, it's it's something that that I really like is as as that you know being able to kind of put put your daily worries away and just get out and sort of really enjoy mm -hmm. nature without feeling like you know you're just getting baked by the sun and it's just so is it like a wild is it a wilderness I mean I imagine it's when you get out there's not a lot of I don't know but um, is that is it an empty sort of place from people once you get away from the um, city? not well yes and no i mean not not it's not completely vacant i mean there's lots mm -hmm. of like small towns and stuff but you can you know you could um basically there's like where i really like to say holiday is go up to the north shore which the the northern uh northeast portion of of minnesota uh, borders one of the great lakes so it's just very, it's very rocky up there. There's a lot of, you know, the trees are more coniferous. Mm. So it just, it feels, I've always loved Colorado for the mountains. So it kind of feels like that without mm. being as large or majestic, mm. but it's mm. just, you, you get a, a sense of ruggedness and, and wilderness. Um, you know, so if you've ever read any like uh, Jack London or something, it kind of yeah. harkens back, harkens back to that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, grand. And what what other projects are you involved in at the moment? What else are you doing? I'm working on a, a, a fun project. I should have, I could run over and grab it. Um, the last big project that I did was John W. Campbell's uh, Who Goes There? Okay. And which is the basis for all the Thing movies. Yeah. And um, so that's that story is near and dear to my heart. Like I remember stumbling across the movie at my grandparents' house um, when, when they left me alone for, you know, ra a rare occasion where they went out to lunch and I got to use their cable television, which we didn't have mm -hmm. and stumbled across this movie with these effects of these creatures. And it just scared the bejesus out mm -hmm. of me. I mean, I ran outside in the front lawn just because it was like funny and bright and, like nothing can get me here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so basically it took me a few years to find who had, to, who had the copyrights to that and how could I work with them and, and, and found the literary agency. And then we worked up a contract. So I created um, a limited edition of who goes there. Mm. And then one of my, one of the, one of my uh, patrons that, that bought it 
asked me if I'd ever heard of Peter Watts's The Things. And so I, I had I said no, and I looked it up and read it. And so Peter Watts is a is a contemporary Canadian author. Um, he's a zoobiologist. He's got a brilliant mind. Um, and he took this story of the thing and rewrote it from the viewpoint of the alien itself. Right. And so it's it's just it's so good. It's yeah, so yeah. good. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, can I, you know, make a version of your book? And so right now, that's that's what I'm working on. I'm going to be launching it later this month um, and basically taking pre-orders. I've done a lot of illustrations for it and I'm working on like the binding and how the how the book itself will look. Mm -hmm. Um but that whole sort of like that, you know, that universe, like a Marvel universe or the DC universe or whatever, this sort of universe around the thing, this idea of this creature that's, you know, evolved far beyond humankind, that it can change shape and it's it's conquered all these worlds. So it has this this knowledge of eons of of societies alone here on earth and trying to under, you know, he's, he's, it's like, it wakes up and the humans are trying to kill it. And he's just like, what, what's, what's going yeah, on, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just delightful. And so I've been really working hard, hard on truck. Like, how do you illustrate a story? How do you show something from the viewpoint that's so drastically different? Okay. Um, and and so that's been a very fun um a fun project to to kind well, of get you, into. you've sold it to me i now want to get hold of all your books you know <laughs> um so that's a good good segue into how do people get hold of your work it says so, you know yeah yeah so i'm in a few uh you know uh, a, a few book dealers deal uh carry my work in the united states um if if any of of your you know listeners or viewers um, in the UK or elsewhere are interested in carrying it, I would be happy to talk to them. But for most people, the the easiest way would be to go to my website. So it's angelbomb.com. dot com, mm -hmm. just all one word. Nice and easy, angelbomb dot com. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now you know. I was thinking, there was that. Um, I was I went into the, when when we were in the states last I went into uh, a bookshop in Providence Rhode Island in the arcade which is the HP Lovecraft bookshop you may be been there uh, yes and I've been there it's like work. the art Lovecraft arts and scientists yeah, I heard that's Lovecraft it. arts and that's scientists it. yes mm -hmm. do they have your book work there they should do <laughs> if they haven't they've been difficult to to work with I can't remember if they bought one or not it's yes it would be perfect it would be perfect to, to go Somebody there so once contacted me who who has a shop in that arcade heard the podcast and i said i've been in there and they went you must have walked past our shop you know oh. they weren't the lovecraft so it's amazing who listens to this now i'm constantly amazed people say oh yeah i was listening to your podcast i'm like oh blimey you know oh, that's cool yeah 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 so you never know so if anybody wants to carry it or get in touch with oh. you in the in the first instance and the other thing that you've said that is interesting sparked my interest is you know kind of working with um uh, i've always been i've done kind of some live like living authors work but there are other people like um the um, Hell House, uh, Matheson's Hell House, you know, he did uh, I Am Legion and uh, Richard Matheson. And I, and I thought, oh, God, I, thought, I, w I would love to do a version of that. But it's it's that shyness about reaching out to them and then thinking they're going to tie up in legal knots and you, you're going to end up paying a fortune to, to do a version of it. But, but, but it sounds like that isn't the case with, with many people. <laughs> well, it's I mean, we'll, we'll see. It's it's interesting. Um... I had uh, like, I don't, I don't know what the average sort of percentage is, mm -hmm. but um, I felt with um, with working with the you know like uh, the literary agency that handles uh, Campbell's estate, mm -hmm. um, I felt that they were completely reasonable, and They're maybe reasonable. in part, in part because they've been doing it for a long time, or yeah. you know, um, working with live off 
authors um I, like i had i had sent my first proof to um to peter and you know his response was uh was a little bit surprising it turns out like i i couldn't remember where i got my 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 basic document so it mm -hmm. turned out like there was some there were some um you know errors in that that i i wasn't aware of so he was you know he was surprised by that or disappointed but it's like okay well you send me the official copy and we'll get this you know we'll get this yeah, fixed yeah. yeah you know i'm not trying to you know slip one over on you and no. you know slip in you know do anything radically different to your story um but you know he seemed you know pretty pretty content or open to the idea of like i made this story if you want to do you know i've i've done my bit with it yeah you know, if you want to do something, you know, here, feel, feel welcome. So, yes. and, and of course, but you, you, in a sense, not transform it, but you, any, everybody changes it. Your interpretation through your art is an addition to his, he's been one person, you're another person mm -hmm. and say, you know, uh, in the way I do with things, I, I, my, my then voice interpretation is yet another um aspect of the story but you know i always feel i feel like that myself if i write something well I, that, i've done that even just in the reception of it you maybe have the same um idea people respond to your work in their own way and you can't predict how they will and even if they and let's say the people who love it um they love it in their own way you know and they they have their own um resonances in their own uh, attachments to it so but uh, yeah it is interesting so maybe i'll be a bit braver and, and contact people so okay we i can see from the clock we're running out of time so you, i don't know if you can see the clock there but there is a clock counting oh, us now no 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 okay. i can see it yeah <laughs> so i don't want to kind of end it halfway through so angelbomb.com you you've mm -hmm. done a whole ton of work already that people can access um yep i've uh the beast in the cave was my seventh book so mm -hmm. um they're you know they vary in size and scope mm -hmm. um but you know right now that you know the next book i'll be publishing is the things i've got a couple of more personal works coming after that um but i'm also um here like this is the first time that i've spoken about this publicly but um next year like in one year i'm going to be uh sailing to antarctica wow for, for <laughs> thank you for yeah. a um for research for some books based on climate change but also yeah. because i want to do my own interpretation of this idea of an alien creature on yeah. that continent and yeah. so i'm going to go and do research there so so eventually i you know I'll have created like a, a trilogy of books sort of based around the thing, like with who goes there, the things, and then my, my forthcoming oh, yeah. project. So that's m massively exciting. Be careful of the mountains of madness. Uh, but um, <laughs> I will, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, fantastic. We're about to be cut off. So, and at that point, dear listener, we were cut off. Um, I, I think we had a, an exchange of emails to see whether we should, reconnect but i think everything to be said had been said so remember angelbomb.com todd thyberg i'll put the links in the show notes it was a nice interesting um diversion the story itself was simple it was short it was one of lovecraft's early one did he say um i, I didn't know this but he was 14 years old when he wrote it if that's true that's pretty good it's not a bad story at all for a 14 year old goodness me no but um, Todd's work, honestly, is a tactile delight uh, and a visual delight as well with the illustrations. And you can see how they harken back to the pulp illustrations and, and that the whole tradition of illustrating stories, which I always liked, which was a big thing, uh, which we've fallen out of these days. But is, uh, I, like, I like illustrated books. And I think the final thing I want to say is, of course, um, you know, a book, I, I do use e-readers, but um, a book is a book. A book is not just a, a, the words in it. It is, it is the feel of it. it is, is the object. And I think many of you, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, I'm sure many of you actually have books. For, for those of you who go with e-readers, I'm not dissing you. But I'm just saying, you know, just get some, just feel those books. Get one of Todd's books. Just feel it. Uh, yeah, the paper, the embossing, 
the art. It's and the little little Easter eggs that he puts in definitely well worth it. So back to classic. Well, it was a classic weird tale, I suppose. More of that soon. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come dies, back. Don't they? Isn't that so? Music as always by Jonathan Sharp of the Hartwood Institute and of course the words the sample is from the 1970s uh, Satanist biker movie or zombie biker movie I can't remember I have seen it uh, Psychomania it was called something else in the US it was something like uh, Satanic Hell Hell's Angels or something but uh, it's uh, it's a very British film to be fair so anyway Jonathan uh, yes thanks to Jonathan as always Thanks to Todd. Thanks to you for listening. Hope I didn't wake you up.